Might as well go ahead and get started. We've got a good crowd that has gathered for this uh, session. It promises to be a very interesting topic, recycled water. Um, and as we just talked about a little bit uh, there, uh, the transition on our team, uh, a few changes. Lindy uh, Johnson has left uh, the East Bay Leadership um, um, organization, and she is working for Mark, is it the Transportation Commission? Contra Costa Transportation Authority. Yeah, okay, good. Um, additionally, a couple of our co-chairs, uh, Dan McIntyre has retired, is retiring from uh, Dublin San Ramon Services District and, and will no, no longer serve as a co-chair on the Water Task Force. George Smith is trying to get out of it, but <laughs> <laughs> he has not succeeded yet. Um, but anyhow, we, we, we have some changes and, and uh, yeah, you just gotta, that's what happens. And so we'll, we will adopt to that, uh, to those changes. Um, I was looking through the, the list of bills that was, were published on Friday uh, by, of, of the bills that were signed by Governor Newsom, looking for water, environment and energy um, legislation that's new. Um, and uh, if any of the, Water districts out there and sewer districts uh, have uh, a summary of, of how that legislation impacts us. I'd appreciate you if you would share that with us. Um, I did note in there that uh, just related to recycled water, uh, as you know, or most people know, the um, State Water Board issued some uh, regulations for direct potable reuse, and that's been a long time in coming, uh, and that's a game changer uh, in terms of using our recycled water for uh, potable purposes. And so a lot more to come on that. Um, also, the state uh, launched a recycled water strike team uh, this past year with the federal and state industry partners to identify and overcome obstacles to implementation of recycled water projects. And Governor Newsom signed legislation to make certain recycled water projects eligible for expedited judicial review under the California uh, Environmental Quality Act. And so a lot of activity <clears throat> out there um, and we'll stay current on that and keep, uh, keep our group informed. Um, so I'll turn it over to uh, Jackie Kepke who has stepped in for Dan McIntyre in terms of being the keeper of our uh, upcoming meetings. Uh, we, we have a, a Excel spreadsheet and there's a planning group that meets uh, once a quarter and uh, we come up with our agenda for upcoming meetings and uh, so she'll cover that. But if there's if there are topics out there that, that you would like us to, to focus on and cover, uh, please contact any of us and, and we'll try and accommodate that. Jackie? Thanks, Gary. And it's um, Jackie Zipkin now, <laughs> but some Sorry. of you still know me as Kepke. <laughs> um, so I was going to start with the same thing as Gary. We have a really good turnout for this um, meeting. And so we hope to uh, keep that up with interesting, engaging topics. And so if any of you either who join these regularly or who are new just for this recycled water topic, if you have ideas for other topics that would um, would get you to this forum, um, definitely reach out to, to Gary, myself, or others on the planning committee. We would love to hear your ideas. Um, the ideas that we have so far for the next couple of meetings um, in November, we're going to be meeting on a special date, um, currently scheduled for November 14th. So mark your calendars. The normal date that we have for this committee would be during Thanksgiving week. And since we think that uh, probably isn't the best timing, we're going to push it up a little bit. Um, and the topic will be nature-based solutions for water quality and climate resilience. Um, so we're going to have Ian Wren from um, SFEI and Baykeeper, Heidi Nutters from San Francisco Estuary Partnership, Galen O'Toole from Intrinsics, um, really good slate of folks talking about some of the great work that's being done around the Bay for multi-benefit nature-based um, projects along the shoreline. Um, so stay tuned for more information on that. 
Um, in December, we are taking a break. Everyone is busy. And so um, we will leave you to um, spend your break thinking about great topics for this, uh, this organization. And then we'll come back in January with a presentation by Lynn McGuire on carbon intensity and phasing out fossil fuels and energy transitions in the decades ahead. So um, we try to focus on both water and energy topics. Um, and so we're looking forward to that one. Um, in February, we are hoping to have a presentation on the Advanced Quantitative Precipitation Information or AQPI project, which is a regional effort to um, use improved radars to better um, understand and predict uh, atmospheric rivers and precipitation in the Bay Area. So that should also be a great presentation. Um, some of these will be virtual like this one. Some will be in person in um, at Brown and Caldwell and we'll be um, letting folks know um, about that. Most likely will be in person for November. So um, looking forward to seeing everyone then and um, we'll have more. We have a long list of other ideas uh, beyond February. So stay tuned. Thank you, Jackie. And I apologize for uh... <laughs> <laughs> my mind just retreats to uh, the past, I guess, in terms of names and that type of thing. So I really apologize. It's all good. It's still a part of me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so Mark or Meg, do you have any, uh, any, any announcements from the East Bay leadership? I'm going to let Meg take that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so I just have a couple updates for everybody, uh, mostly about events. Uh, we have a lot of exciting events coming up. The uh, first one up is the Capital Series with Assembly Member Rebecca Bauer Cahan. It's actually this week, this Thursday, uh, on October 19th at Roundhouse Conference Center in San Ramon. Um, so if you're interested in attending, uh, the registration will close at noon tomorrow. So be sure to register today if you can. Um, I'll send the registration link in the chat in a bit. And then we're also going to have another Capital Series event coming up with Assembly member Lori Wilson, and that'll be on November 9th on Zoom, and we'll have registration info soon. And then finally, we have our Threads of Hope event, which will be presented with Diablo Magazine, and that's going to be honoring volunteers and philanthropy on December 6th at the Lecture Center for the Arts. And also stay tuned for reg info on that. So lots of exciting events coming up over the next couple months, um, and I'll send a link as well to our events calendar so you can stay up to date. All right. Thank you, Meg. Uh, so, as a part of this meeting, uh, a group has been working on um, some language that we would like to put in front of the East Bay Leadership Council, uh, and it relates to uh, developing recycled water at the Concord Naval Weapons Station. So, Mark uh, has met with uh, Contra Costa Water District, East uh, um, Central Sayan, City of Concord, and the developer uh, for the Concord Naval Weapons Station. And uh, along with uh, Dave Riqua, uh, drafted the original language, and, and Bob Whitley um, has been involved in uh, its pretty short language where we would like to propose that the East Bay Leadership Council support the development of uh, recycled water at the Concord Naval Weapon Station. So, Mark, do you want to give a little overview on that? And I, I think we'll, we can. Put it up for a vote or just exactly how you want to do that yeah thank you no i'll i'll keep it very brief i mean i think it, it came up through conversations with leaders of this group that it would be helpful for the organization uh, to have some kind of a policy uh, stance policy recommendation to bring to our board that would help us in the advocacy that will follow in the months years to come uh, with the concord reuse project so um, certainly recycled water is, is an important piece of the puzzle there also is incredible costs and lots of uh, kind of unknown questions about how we would actually deliver that in the future. Wanted to make sure we engaged our partners at Contra Costa Water District and Central San in that, uh, in that conversation. In the end, what I'd be looking for from this group is, and I, I would uh, entertain a motion in, in, this, in this regard, but kind of to help us continue to develop and adopt a policy recommendation in support of the maximization of recycled water and reuse and commit the East Bay Leadership Council to supporting all partners in seeking grants and funds for future infrastructure, right? So it's about a motion for us to, to do our best to help our partners maximize the use of recycled water um, and to commit the East Bay Leadership Council to being a resource in seeking grants and funds 
uh, to help that work get done. So um, I'm happy I can I can share the document with whoever would like. I see Bob's hand. Well, you asked for a motion, so I'll make the motion uh, <laughs> um, to do so. Uh, and probably some type of a summary of what's in the document would be helpful. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I, I, Megan, I, I, would, I would second that motion, by the way, this is Dave Requa. All right, so we have a motion and a second. It, 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 am I right, Bob? Were you asking for anything else? Just clarification there? Just, no, just to clarify what what's... Uh, What's in the policy statement? Hey, Meg, can you give me screen share access? I'll just share the draft with folks really quickly to make sure that we're in good shape. Yep, one second. As I mentioned before, the original draft was uh, came about through a conversation with Bob Whitley and Dave Rico, Dave did the original drafting. So thank you, Dave. All right, so here we are, short, short and sweet. So some, some kind of simple facts off the top as a new development, the Concord Community Reuse Project provides a unique opportunity to incorporate the use of recycled water into the foundational infrastructure. Planning studies for the Concord Community Reuse Project anticipate that the peak monthly use of recycled water could range from 5.2 to 5.8 million gallons per day. This re represents a substantial reduction in the use of potable water for irrigation and sanitary plumbing that would be required if recycled water is not fully, fully utilized in the project. Um, so here's, here's the meat. Uh, the recommendation that we'll be bringing to, to, to the board of directors here shortly, based on this information, the Water, Energy, and Environment Task Force makes the following recommendations to the East Bay Leadership Council regarding the use of recycled water, uh, support the existing area plan and reuse plan objectives and measures that require and identify the city of Concord, Contra Costa Water District, and Central Contra Costa Sanitary District, and Brookfield to partner in maximizing the cost-effective uses of recycled water in the implementation of the Concord Community Reuse Project. Also committing the East Bay Leadership Council to supporting any and all the partners in seeking grants and or low interest loans to implement the maximum use of recycled water. So um, hopefully I did that justice in, in my introduction there, Bob, but uh, I'm not sure if you want to, to restate your motion and then take a second now that we have that information. No, the motion still stands. Okay, so we've got a motion by Bob, second by Dave. Just kind of by unanimous approval here, if anyone has any strong concerns, they can be heard now. Seeing none, I will move forward and bring this to our board as soon as possible. Thank you all. Thank, thank you for your time. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Mark. And thanks for meeting with the partners there to make sure that the language is acceptable to them. That was good. Yeah, I will say, I mean, the fact that they kind of collaborated in that way to help provide some feedback and engage in that letter was was incredibly helpful. So um, hat tip to our partners at both the Water District and Central San. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll turn it over to Don Berger to introduce our uh, speakers uh, for today. Take it up. Take Thanks, Gary. Good morning and welcome, everyone. Uh, it's great to see a lot of familiar faces out there, and I'm glad we see such great attendance for our, our double feature this morning on Recycle Water. Um, we, uh, we are privileged to have two speakers today, Harold Leverance from UC Davis and Dave Richardson from Woodard and Curran, to give us both a statewide and a local perspective on the potential for Recycle Water. Um, uh, Harold will be presenting on the results of uh, a recently completed uh, Water Research Foundation work study on identifying the amount of wastewater that is available and feasible to recycle in California, where, where he was the principal investigator. And uh, you know, just thinking back over the years, I know, you know Gary's probably thought about this question. A lot of us have. There's been a lot of back of the envelope calculations, let's just say, on done to try to estimate how much wastewater um, that's discharged is actually available to reuse in, in California and in the Bay Area. In fact, I remember Dave Richardson doing those calculations for the Bay Area with me about 10 years ago, trying to estimate that. Um, but as we'll hear today, it's it's a little more complicated than, than just adding up all the wastewater that's discharged. Uh, you know, we need to take into account things like uh, required minimum in-stream flows, water quality, 
proximity to use sites, and of course the cost uh, of recycled water. Um, and today we'll we'll finally hear the answer to that question that we've all been wondering is, is Harold will enlighten us uh, on, on their findings. Um, our, our second presenter is uh, Dave Richardson from Woodard and Curran, who will share the results of a recent BACWA study on the use of water recycling to further reduce nutrient discharges uh, to the Bay. Uh, we'll taking a closer look at what's actually feasible and practical from a local perspective. Um, and I, uh, I also want to say I've known Dave for a long time, and I really admire his vast knowledge of the water recycling business, and I've always appreciated his willingness to share what he knows with others and to work uh, to come up with creative ideas to, to challenging problems. And I'll have more to say about Dave shortly. Um, and I wanted to say uh, I'll be moderating. So if you have questions as we go along, please put them into the chat. Uh, go ahead and type them in and I'll have our speakers either answer them as we go or we'll, we'll address them at the end during our Q&A after, after both speakers uh, talk. So, okay, so let's, um, Let's go ahead and jump into our first presentation. And I'd like to introduce Harold Leverance, who um, is a research engineer in civil engineering at, at UC Davis. And he's also an environmental engineer at the firm Biohabitat. He's got multiple hats there. Um, he's, his background is in, is, is, has been really focused in water and wastewater process pilot testing, modeling, natural treatment systems, and, and resource recovery. And, some of his recent projects have included the development of, and testing of novel uh, and wastewater, novel water and wastewater treatment processes. Um, he received uh, degrees in biosystems engineering at Michigan State University, his doctorate at Davis. And uh, I also wanted to acknowledge um, Harold's two co-investigators. I don't think they're on with, on with us today, but uh, Dr. Rita Hiro uh, Sushihashi of Jacobs Engineering and Peter Laskier of Laskier Engineering, um, who uh, were, were the co-investigators in, in, in his study. Uh, so um, with that, uh, I'd like to go ahead and turn the meeting over to Harold. Harold, welcome. Uh, great, thanks so much, uh, Don, for that introduction. Let's pull up the uh, slides. Let's see. Is that uh, looking okay? It looks good. Great, thank you. All right, uh, well, thanks everyone. And let me uh, see if I can get this. One second, I uh, figure out the screen here. Sorry for a little delay. All good. All right. Still looking good? Yep, looks good. Thanks so much. All right. Well, I'm uh, happy to be here today to go through the study we did. I wanted to mention that this study actually started before the pandemic. So in 2019 is when we wrote a proposal and got this uh, project kicked off. And so a lot of the data we were using was kind of pre-pandemic. So keep that in mind as we kind of get into this, since a lot of this has changed uh, since then. Um, and I wanted to acknowledge uh, Rijo Tushihashi was my kind of co-author in developing these slides. And so I uh, added him here on the co-authorship. There's also a link at the bottom of the slide here which goes to the, the Water uh, Research Foundation's website where there's a, a page for this project and it has the project report. Um, but if you have any trouble getting the project report, then let me just send me an email and I can uh, send it to you. Or I'll send it to, uh, to Don and he can post it on the, on the page. Let's see. All right, the research team here was uh, kind of a wonderful team. Like I said, we had uh, myself and Reggio and Pete Lasquier as the PIs, but we also had a project team of folks that are experts in GIS modeling and, uh, and data processing. Um, and we had a really exceptional advisory committee, including uh, George Vaniglis, Russ Adams, Rob Beggs, Erica Bench, and Madeline Kelsch. 
And we also had uh, on the WERF side, like a project advisory committee of uh, technical experts, subject matter, magic, or subject matter experts in this field. Uh, WRF staff who assisted us and also representatives from the water board who kind of uh, assisted us in terms of getting access to data and that type of thing. So the topics I wanna to go through today are kind of going over the study objectives that we had, looking at the background of wastewater management in California and kind of how we got here. Um, going over that, how we identified like the amount of water that might be available for, uh, for reuse in California. And then kind of digging into some of the factors and considerations that are involved in terms of like how to get recycled water from a treatment plant to a reuse site, what the cost might be to treat that water and to transport it to the reuse site, and then how we integrated these models together to come up with an overall picture of, of costs to uh, develop recycled water projects. In general, like, we had two objectives. The first objective was just to try to understand how much water is available uh, in California. And, and I guess we, uh, we focused on the year 2030, basically, for making some estimates. And then for this water that is available or potentially available, how much of that is really feasible to use in recycled water projects, given you know, various constraints like in-stream flows and water quality and distance to reuse sites? and costs. And of course, this was the real complex uh, part of the project because it's hard to understand the feasibility of projects in every different area. You know, there's a lot of site specific factors that really drive these projects. And so starting to think about kind of a historical perspective that in the 19, you know, 80s and 90s when recycled water was really uh, kind of taking off in California, um, there was some estimates that there would be pretty uh, high level of water uh, reuse by now, kind of estimating, you know, uh, maybe about double of what it is actually right now. And so there was a question about how did this even happen? How did we get our estimates so far off that uh, <clears throat> that we'd be you know, recycling a lot of water and then it didn't really materialize that way? And so when we went back and started looking into this, it became pretty clear that one thing that happened during this time is uh, pretty, uh, in California, a very large amount of water conservation. So water conservation really uh, to, you know, reduced the amount of water that is technically available and it had a huge impact about our estimates. And so we'll, uh, we'll get into this a bit more as we uh, dive into this. And then the other thing that happened in 2019 was this was the first year that the State Water Board did the volumetric annual report, which is a, uh, a survey of uh, major wastewater treatment facilities. And it uh, collects data about, you know, their monthly uh, influent, effluent, recycled water, you know, what recycled water is being used for, details about the treatment facility, a lot of information. And really, uh, it was really a wonderful data set that made this project possible. So. Kudos to the state water board for uh, for collecting this data. Um, and I should mention that they collect this data every year. 2019 was just the first year, and it was the data that we used for this study. Um, but in this data set, it was uh, included in nearly 700 facilities, like major facilities. And what was interesting is when we looked into it, that we found a couple of facts that uh, that most facilities are less than 4 million gallon per day. Um, <clears throat> and then in fact, if we looked at like just the largest 100 facilities, that that's practically 90% of the total like effluent, uh, you know, going through wastewater treatment facilities. And if you even look at the 10 largest, it's more than half of the wastewater. And so when we start thinking about how could we recycle, you know, more uh, water volume, from this view, it just seemed like it would make sense to focus on, you know, the largest facility since that's where most of the volumetric uh, capacity is at. And uh, and so that was kind of an early on uh, an observation that most of this uh, water is going through a few facilities and that there probably wasn't, you know, there's not much happening at the facility is less than 4 million gallon per day because it amounts to a relatively small volume of the total total flow. It might be important for local reuse projects but in terms of the statewide volumetric water balance, it doesn't add up to too much. 
Um, so we also looked at like, you know, how that these flows varied uh, on a monthly basis. And you can see the plot here on the left that recycled water is this line, the purple line on the bottom. And it was, uh, you know, relatively on the low side around 50,000 acre feet per month with like uh, maybe a peak in the summer because a lot of the reuse in California is irrigation based. And so if it's, you know, irrigation reuse, then it's uh, a lot more use in the summer. Um, discharge to uh, surface waters, like inland surface waters is the blue line. You can see that it's relatively constant, uh, maybe a little bit below 100,000 acre feet per month. And then discharge to coastal waters, maybe about double that. And if we take that and kind of put it in a stack bar chart on the right, you can see that maybe like reuse and in inland discharges accounts for about half and discharge into coastal waters in the state amounts to about half of the total influent flow. <clears throat> when we were doing this study, one kind of complicating factor that came up is that is how you even define reuse because we know that in the state uh, a level that these are projects that are permitted and we call those kind of planned reuse projects where we basically, you know, have a, a permitted volume of water and quality that's going to some specific reuse application. And here on the chart, I showed that maybe city A has a planned reuse project that's going to agriculture irrigation. But then if that same city discharges their effluent into the river and that river flows down the stream and gets pumped out again for uh, irrigation, then we don't call it reuse. Um, and so that's a little bit of a, <clears throat> and it makes, you know, you could look at the reasons why that is, but also it makes it complicated to understand like the whole water balance and how water is being used and reused uh, within this system. And we could even extrapolate this farther that if city A is discharging into the stream and it's going downstream and getting extracted as a potable water supply, then this really unplanned uh, potable reuse, and we call that in uh, de facto indirect reuse. And so we realized early on that this was going to be a, a kind of a complicating factor that we weren't really going to be able to address uh, in this project. But we wanted to acknowledge that there's a lot of de facto reuse that's happening in California. And it would be interesting to know what that is because it is a form of reuse. And it's different than discharging water into the ocean. If we discharge it into the stream, it gets reused again. It might be habitat in the stream while it's there. Like those are beneficial uses. Whereas if we discharge this into the ocean, then we don't really have as much beneficial use there or practically none actually. Um, we can also look at these flows and how they're divided by waterboard region. And that's what we did. We looked at each region to understand what are the, you know, what's happening in each region in terms of the water balance. And so when we divide up the flows uh, by region, you see that region two is a, uh, a major uh, source of uh, wastewater effluent volume. And practically all of it, I would say, is going into ocean disposal. So I would say that's really, you know, in terms of like the uh, a site that we'd want to focus on, I think region two looks like it has a lot of potential. Region four, Los Angeles, also uh, has a really significant ocean uh, uh, discharge, but of, of course, in they have a lot of uh, water reuse capacity that's also been installed. And so we see that here under region four. Other two regions are the Santa Ana region and the San Diego region, which both have uh, you know, a pretty significant ocean discharge uh, amount, but also a lot of uh, reuse, uh, especially in region eight. And so, <clears throat> um, yeah, so basically it makes sense that you know, in coastal areas, there'd be a lot more uh, ocean discharge. And that's what we saw here. And then a lot more, you know, inland discharge and the inland systems are generally smaller. Um, looking at the distribution of uh, recycled water use in California, these are permitted recycled water projects. You see that, you know, irrigation is uh, pretty significant. And like we said earlier, the issue with irrigation is that it's a seasonal demand. Also pretty significant groundwater uh, recharge, mostly due to Orange County's project. Um, and then as we go down, you get you can see we can maybe get to higher, uh, higher cost types of reuse. 
and very little uh, at this time, keep in mind this was 2019, that we didn't have too many uh, like potable reuse or non-potable reuse projects at that point. Um, let's see. So thinking through like some of the key obstacles that uh, that we encountered, one is just the way that we designed our wastewater infrastructure system. So we want to like think about, you know, how is how did our infrastructure get set up this way, um, and what are the implications? Pretty dynamic conditions in terms of like, you know, uh, drought uh, conditions happening, putting stress on uh, potable water supplies. We see changes in populations, uh, and this long term changes in indoor water use. Um, like I was saying back in, you know, when we were developing recycled water uh, kind of guidelines or goals, maybe in like the 90s, the water use at that point was over like 100 gallons per person uh, in a lot of places. And for example, I remember in Davis at this time was about 100 gallons per person per day for indoor use. And now that's gone to, down to 35 gallons per person per day in Davis. And so that's a really significant drop in, uh, in influent flow. And that has an impact on recycled water uh, projects as well. And then the uh, cost is obviously the key uh, consideration and driver for these projects. And so we looked at the, you know, the capital operation and uh, permit compliance costs. Although we didn't actually factor in the cost of permit compliance, we did look at all the, uh, the costs for capital uh, installations and operations. And then maybe like one of the most significant factors it's just that there's not a lot of perceived threat to existing water supply. That if you feel comfortable and secure with the water supply you have, and it's relatively low cost, you probably don't go out looking to do like a more expensive water project using an alternative supply. And so we find in a lot of cases that it's just economics that are uh, the major consideration. So thinking more about this, uh, you know, our infrastructure systems and kind of how we got here, it was, uh, you know, developed over the last, over the 20th century primarily. And what we did is, uh, is focus on gravity drainage to low lying areas. And so when you design your collection systems to gravity drain to like the discharge location where the discharge location is usually, you know, near a surface water or uh, near in a coastal like ocean discharge location, that <clears throat> it makes it really difficult to go back afterwards and, and uh, retrofit this system for water recycling. And so just thinking about some of the problems and uh, with this type of infrastructure approach is that it's not very uh, well adapted to, uh, to low flows. Like I was saying, this reduction in, uh, in water use, indoor water use. And for example, one thing uh, that we're seeing is as you reduce like flows going into collection systems, we get more fermentation and hydrogen sulfide production and methane production in the wastewater collection system, which increases the rate of corrosion and, uh, and odor uh, generation and other issues. So it's really, you know, can have an impact on the infrastructure uh, lifespan, as well as, uh, you know, a lot of odor complaints. And so <clears throat> that's kind of inherent in these, our existing infrastructure in a lot of places, especially where we have low uh, slope. Uh, vulnerabilities with climate change in the sense that we have sea level rise, which is starting to impact some of these facilities in terms of getting uh, like salt water intrusion or seawater intrusion into our wastewater, which also has an impact on the TDS of our recycled water supply. So there's uh, no, no limit to that. Um, and then, of course, if we wanted to do like recycled water projects, for example, a non potable reuse project, there's almost no options left, right? Because it was really expensive to run purple pipes back into the into the community. Um, this community is already like built and paved and like, how would you go in and tear it up? And there's also not a lot of uh, areas left for agriculture in these regions. And, uh, and even recharge is hard to find. So basically we're kind of out in these areas and we can't find really low cost uh, water reuse, at least not non-potable. Um, <clears throat> so starting to think about you know, taking all these into these factors into consideration, we did this study and the methodology that we came up with was starting with this 2019 data set um, from the state water board. And then we, using that, went through and calculated, you know, our best guess and estimate about what the dry weather flow was based on, you know, the summer season. 
And then we uh, use that to project the 2030 uh, flows based on projected population changes from the Department of Finance and uh, in indoor uh, water use projections from DWR. And at the same time, there was another statewide study that was being done to look at the impacts of, uh, of reduced flows on wastewater facilities. And so that study actually generated this, uh, some of the data on population and, and water use in different regions in the future. And so we uh, worked with them to get that data. Uh, let's see. We also looked at uh, water losses through treatment processes. Primarily, you know, we looked at, you know, could there be a significant evaporation, which there wasn't, or could there be significant water loss in the solids management scheme? And there, you know, and there wasn't really. So pretty minor losses uh, through the treatment process. We looked at inflow or in-stream uh, flow discharge requirements. This would be, for example, where you have like habitat, could be like fish uh, in a stream. And then there might be a requirement from the water board to keep water, a certain you know flow in that stream to support that habitat. And what we found is that this is very uh, minor and it's almost, uh, it doesn't impact anything because it's such a small uh, usage at this point. But we thought maybe with drought conditions that there could be more in-stream flow discharge requirements in the future. But so far, like we haven't really uh, seen that. <clears throat> Um, we also uh, looked through the existing reuse data and subtracted that out so we're not double counting any existing reuse projects. And from all this, we estimated how much water uh, effluent there might be in 2030. And then we also continued on to estimate how much water uh, could be reused in 2030. Um, so thinking through the 2019, this would be our, like our baseline uh, amount, and this is similar to the data that we uh, showed earlier, except for that in this one, it's broken down by facility size. And so you can see that in like, for example, in region uh, four, it's uh, basically like driven by a couple large facilities. Whereas in region two, it's probably balanced in the terms of like, there's maybe like, you know, some uh, large facilities but it's really balanced with other smaller facilities that are in the, the four to 20 million gallon a day range and the 20 to 50 million gallon a day range. So kind of better distributed in region two compared to region four. I also wanna point out that the total dry weather influent flow for region two at this point was estimated, you can see it's about 520,000 uh, <clears throat> acre feet per year. Um, just a a slide to kind of reinforce the changes in in uh, in water use, and yeah, I think the uh, the main thing for us was that you know water use is changing across the state, and it it's not the same rate of change in every region, but that some areas, especially like like Santa Cruz, some places in Southern California, and some other communities are really getting to uh, much uh, to the into this low range of flows like thirty five gallons per person per day. Um, so thinking through the, like how we took this into consideration in terms of like the, uh, the population change and the in indoor water use changes, we came up with factors to adjust for each uh, water board region and for each uh, facility size. And so the purpose of this was really to say, how can we, you know, take our, our flows from the 2019 time period and extrapolate that to 2030. We did that with these adjustment factors that were based on population and expected changes in water use rates. Um, and we we did look at different climate scenarios. Uh, this again was in 2019, so it was kind of like uh, in you know in the middle of a drought period to some extent. But for example, in Region Two, for facilities that were less than like four million gallon a day, we anticipated like a 19 percent increase in the dry weather flow and facilities that were four to 20 million gallon per day, like for example here is estimating a 14% increase. And this is primarily driven by uh, an expected population influx uh, into the Bay Area. And that may or may not be the case uh, today. Uh, again, for 20 to 50 million gallon a day, estimated 20% increase. And then 50 to 100 million gallon a day, uh, maybe like a 9% increase. And then for this large facility, 100 greater than 100 million gallon per day, 
76% increase. I think in retrospect, that uh, number probably isn't like uh, too meaningful and that we're probably not going to see that much of an increase. But I just wanted to point out that that was the number that was used in this study based on this other uh, study that we referenced. And so I wanted to uh, show what the impacts of that are. So like I was saying in region two, for the 2019, the actual dry weather flow was about 520,000 gallons, or oh, sorry, 520,000 acre feet per year. And with the new estimate in 2030, that pushed it up to about 660,000 acre feet per year. So that does uh, result in like a marginal increase in the region two uh, influent volume. It didn't have a big impact on the study, but I wanted to point it out. <clears throat> Other types of corrections we made is we wanted to look at each type of reuse uh, in each region and see how like the reuse volume in each region might be impacted by the nature of the reuse itself. And so for example, here we looked at uh, in irrigation uh, systems and this data comes from the volumetric annual report where it's collecting monthly uh, flows to reuse projects. And so we looked at projects like irrigation reuse projects and what their uh, water use uh, profile looks like. And what we found is that, you know, there's a peak for water use in uh, in the summer for irrigation projects, uh, depending on where they're at in the state, of course. But that uh, in this case, for example, that only 42% of the of the water was actually used for irrigation. And then you had more than 50% of the flow that doesn't get used because it's not uh, required uh, during the non-irrigation season. And so when we're looking at irrigation projects, we need to basically consider that it's seasonal reuse and that, you know, that they're not going to be able to take all the effluent in the winter season. And so we applied corrections in each region um, for what we anticipated the irrigation demands to be. We also looked at kind of urban and industrial reuse uh, projects. And we found that in a lot of cases, it was more like 85 to 90 percent of the flow could be used because it has a more uniform year round demand. And so for us, this was a key factor in terms of considering the volume, you know, the total volume you could reuse because if we're sending our water to irrigation reuse, then that automatically limits the amount because you're going to have all the excess water in the winter season. Compared to if we go to like an industrial reuse, we might get uh, more like, you know, uh, more uniform water use through the whole year, even in the winter season. We applied the same type of like 85% uh, recovery uh, also to like uh, to uh, potable reuse projects. And the losses there would be most primarily due to uh, blowdown of the concentrate. And so just kind of a high level of how this study went is, uh, you know, we started with the 2019 influent. We made corrections for population growth and water conservation. We subtracted out the water that's already going to recycled water projects. We subtracted out like uh, water losses that might happen due to solids management, subtracted out in-stream uh, required flows. And then we basically, um, we looked at uh, those factors for how much water could actually be uh, be recovered given different reuse. And so we ran that model for all these different uh, reuse applications and applying different factors that were relevant for those applications. <clears throat> so the uh, the overall modeling approach, we uh, focused on just facilities that were greater than 4 million gallon a day. And the reason for that is because, I, like I said earlier, that there's only relatively like a uh, limited number of facilities that are in this flow range, but it actually you know amounts to uh, a huge amount of the total flow. So we thought that focusing on these uh, greater than 4 million gallon a day facilities would really help us keep the modeling to like, uh, a manageable uh, effort, but still capture the the data in the model. Um, we also looked at recycled water conveyance, like transporting the recycled water from each treatment facility uh, to each reuse site. And uh, and to do this, we built a database that uh, or multiple databases for different reuse sites. For example, a database of all the agricultural uh, irrigation areas a database of like refineries and power plants, databases of, uh, you know, other water systems. And we'll dig into that a little bit later. We take these databases and we put them into an ArcGIS model. 
And ARC just already uh, had the data in there from like where all the wastewater treatment facilities are lo located at and what the flow is at for these facilities. And so taking into in this ArcGIS model, you know, which is basically for uh, spatial modeling, we looked at where are the treatment facilities located at, how much water do we have at these treatment facilities, and then where are all the reuse sites uh, distributed at. And we put all those on a map, basically, and then uh, we use ArcGIS to connect those, the treatment facilities with the reuse sites. Um, <clears throat> and in addition, we uh, built an economic model that looked at each treatment facility and like I was saying in this volumetric annual report where it has the data for each treatment facility, it also includes like the treatment level at that facility. So we took the existing treatment level and we looked at what would be the cost to upgrade, you know, to the next level up. So if it's a secondary facility, like what would be the cost to upgrade to tertiary? And then what are all the reuse sites we could reach if we upgraded to tertiary? And then we said, what if we upgraded to, uh, you know, to advanced treatment? And then we looked at what are all the reuse sites we could hit if we went to advanced treatment. And then we said, what if we went up to like uh, enhanced advanced treatment, which would basically be like RO and biological activated carbon, for example. So even a higher level of treatment for potable reuse. Um, and then we basically integrated these, the conveyance model, the spatial conveyance model with the treatment cost upgrade model to get the results of the study. So just diving in a little bit to see like what this ArcGIS model, how it was uh, set up. We looked at databases for agricultural reuse regions, uh, commercial industrial potable uh, reuse sites or non-potable uh, reuse sites, groundwater recharge areas. Uh, there's large maps of California that show the different regions where you can infiltrate water. And so we uh, utilize that database. We looked at groundwater injection uh, areas. We looked at uh, surface water reservoirs that could be recharged. We also looked at direct uh, raw water uh, augmentation and injecting recycled water directly into potable water systems. Um, and here's a little graphic on the right that just shows, you know, we have some particular wastewater treatment facility X, and we just had it make pathways uh, in ArcGIS, model pathways to each of these potential reuse sites. And uh, and it, within ArcGIS, how this is done is you basically put on a uh, define all the, sur you know, a surface uh, across the whole state. And the surface talks about what type of land it is. And then the model determines, you know, the cost to uh, put the pipeline over those different areas. And then the model selects the least cost path to get to a certain location. And so ArcGIS automatically goes in and calculates, you know, the best path to get to an irrigated uh, area, for example. And it would do that by following roads and other, uh, and, you know, following basically a, uh, a formula that we give it. So it doesn't go like across the lake or something or across private property. Uh, this is just an example of the ArcGIS model. It's kind of complicated because it's usually a bunch of different data sources. And so it is pulling all these data sources in to basically calculate these optimum path pathways. It would take like hours or overnight for these models to run. So they're relatively complicated. Um, when we uh, put this data into ArcGIS, we basically on the right is kind of one of, for example, one of the spatial databases showing I think this is uh, irrigated agricultural sites, for example. And then on the left would be the output from ArcGIS where it shows a treatment facility. In this case, it's in the top left corner of that graphic, the map. And then it's showing different pathways to uh, irrigation areas or potential recharge sites. Um, and so we had basically for each treatment facility, we had a map showing pathways that uh, could be used to reach different reuse sites. Of course, that wasn't the same in every area. Um, this is just an example of what the output looked like from the uh, the transport models. So we had a distribution of transport distances. And so you can see kind of ranging from very close, like practically next door adjacent across the road, up to like 100 miles away. And of course, like transporting water 100 miles would get really expensive. And that's why we ended up with a distribution of transport costs as well. So we basically, from very low costs, up to like you know over a you know fifteen hundred dollar per acre foot just for transportation, 
you know, if you're going 100 miles, for example, or depending on where you're located at. Um, in terms of like the cost for upgrading treatment facilities, we kind of developed this kind of matrix approach where we uh, said, you know, for an existing treatment plan, if it's secondary and you want to upgrade it to like uh, tertiary, then you then we have to add in filtration, disinfection. If we want to upgrade to IPR, then we have to add advanced treatment. If we want to upgrade to DPR, then we have to add and enhance advanced treatment. And so we went through for each treatment facility, depending on what, you know, their current level of treatment uh, was and then we just calculated what it would cost to upgrade it to these other uh, other levels of treatment, and we did that using published uh, data. So in the literature, even including some other WRF studies, there was published data about cost curves for different processes, and we did update those uh, cost curves to like uh, current costs. But it could be that they were still kind of on the low side in the sense that it's just the baseline cost and it doesn't incorporate any site specific factors. Um, but we basically ended up with cost curves for the capital costs and for the O&M costs. And then we in integrated those costs together to come up with an overall cost curve for each process upgrade. And then we went through, we applied this like a uh, model to each treatment facility in California that we were looking at. This is just an example of some of the equations I got. Uh, that we use, I think these were from uh, the Schimler uh, reference. And when you look in the report, it'll be really clear where all this data came from. But you can see here we have upgrade for, uh, you know, for membranes, for RO, for advanced oxidation. Um, and then for DPR, we included additional treatment by ozone and uh, biological activated carbon. <clears throat> so uh, thinking through like the, uh, the overall treatment costs, this is basically the model output for the baseline costs. So this is saying for like a facility that's 4 million gallon per day, upgrading from secondary to tertiary might cost $718 per acre foot. These would be like the median costs. Upgrading from secondary to tertiary, sorry, to IPR would run uh, $1,600 per acre foot. And upgrading to DPR might be over $2,000 per acre foot. And you can see that the costs uh, generally go down as the facility size increases due to economy of sale uh, scale considerations. Um, I wanted to mention that we did not uh, include like concentrate management just because it's uh, very site specific and we didn't really have any basis to factor this in. But adding in, uh, <clears throat> adding in, uh, concentrate management could increase the costs. You know, what we saw is 70 to $700 per acre foot based on 2014 data. So even more we expect uh, now. So that's another factor that needs to be uh, incorporated. And the data that's shown in this table doesn't include the transport costs. Those were added on separately. Um, and so when we did uh, integrate like all the transport costs, and the treatment costs together, we ended up with these these kind of this uh, this distribution of costs. Let's say the uh, on the the x axis is basically the, the total cumulative in uh, volume going to reuse in terms of million acre feet per year. So you can see this gets up to like close to like uh, two million acre feet per year, which would have been like you know maybe the maximum uh, reuse potential. And then we basically produce these curves that show like how much it would cost to uh, to produce water uh, at that, basically to meet that volumetric uh, reuse demand. And so if we look at, for example, recharge basins, that it looks like there's a lot of uh, like low cost recharge that could potentially be implemented in some areas, but you can see that as you extrapolate, extrapolate this out to larger volumes, the cost uh, goes up. And this is because we're getting to like, less ideal places, it gets more expensive. So in some places, it might cost $1,000 per acre foot to do recharge basins. In other places, it might cost you know next to nothing. Um, and we also, you can see the curves up here, for example, the blue curve for uh, direct uh, potable reuse, it maybe has some of the highest costs, um, but you can also see it also results in the greatest amount potential volume of water reuse, because if we're going to either, uh, uh, indirect or direct potable reuse, we basically get to utilize a lot, you know, most of the water. We don't have the seasonality. 
And so we get to the largest reuse volume, but of course it has a great cost too. <clears throat> Um, we did compare uh, coastal systems and inland systems. And of course, there's a lot more volume potential that could be recovered in coastal areas. Um, and in general, the cost for reuse is uh, lower in inland sites just because there's a lot more potential for irrigation and groundwater recharge. And once you get into coastal areas, you know, like the, the reuse sites are a lot farther away and there's a lot less uh, availability. And so the costs are higher in coastal areas. Um, so just a quick summary here. that When we looked at the total amount of water that's being recycled now, and if you included the water that's being discharged into surface water and then potentially being like used for habitat or used uh, you know, downstream for some other uh, uses, that is about half of the water in California is going to either planned reuse or what I would call unplanned reuse. Um, and that uh, in the total influent is maybe 3.3 million acre feet uh, in 2030 is what we're uh, projecting. And of that, it seems like there could be 2.6 million acre feet of potential effluent that's not going to reuse projects right now. But then when we took all the factors into consideration, maybe the total was about 2.1 million acre feet that could be recycled in 2030 uh, if it was all used, and that's kind of looking at the highest uh, demand, uh, you know, the highest uh, reuse potential, which is pretty much uh, potable reuse projects. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, let's see, permitted non-potable reuse options <clears throat> are lower cost than DPR um, because, yeah, it's less treatment uh, results in a lower uh, cost. But then again, because of those other factors we talked about, the reuse potential is also lower. And so there's this kind of trade-off between maximizing the potential for reuse and then the costs. Um, and uh, water reuse in, is higher in coastal areas due to more limited non-potable reuse options. And, uh, and that's basically the lack of irrigation sites and a lack of uh, groundwater recharge sites. Um, at least surface spreading. And I guess we should mention that the surface recharge, like surface spreading, is kind of this anomaly, I think, because it's basically doing potable reuse in the sense that you're recharging groundwater supplies, but then we're not treating that water to advanced uh, water that's only tertiary effluent. And so we're really depending on, you know, a lot of advanced treatment to happen in the soil. And I guess I'm wondering if, you know, going in the future, if that's going to stay that way or if there might be more restrictions placed due to water quality concerns. And so I think even though the recharge basins look like the best bet going forward to maximize reuse at the lowest cost, I think there are some questions about water quality there that are gonna come up later. And then basically getting to get to the greatest uh, total volume of reuse, we really need to be looking at potable reuse uh, projects because that's where we get the greatest uh, water recovery and the greatest potential uh, reuse volume. Um, I guess I should mention that, you know, all these are driven by local like costs and for a different, you know, for a, a given district, if they have a low cost uh, water supply now, it's probably going to be hard to justify a very expensive recycled water project if there's no, you know, perceived threat to the water supply. Uh, and so just to review some of the limitations of the study, because there were a lot that we didn't look at concentrate management, we didn't look at uh, you know, specifics about facility siting, like where we would build these recycled water uh, infrastructure. We didn't look at purple pipe urban uh, distribution systems just because that's very site specific and we didn't have the data to do that. Um, <clears throat> the cost model was based on the on literature models and probably represents kind of the, the baseline cost and does not represent costs necessarily in California. Um, especially not in some of the areas like the Bay Area or Los Angeles, where we expect projects to be relatively expensive. Um, we we looked at the discharge requirements for in-stream flow, but it was really negligible, and it doesn't amount to anything uh, at this time. And that the few actual changes in population and future water use, we don't really know, and we were just kind of you know making some educated guesses on that. So there were a lot of limitations in this study. And maybe that we didn't want to look at the results of the study and say, this is the number, but it's more of like looking at the trends 
and to get an idea of what the distribution might look like. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank you for your attention and yeah, uh, definitely get back to me with any questions and uh, happy to, to talk more about it. Thanks. Well, th thank you very much, Harold. That was really informative, a, a really a phenomenal study, a landmark study that um, uh, really lays the groundwork, you know, for our understanding of really what's out there and what's potentially available. Um, and I, and I want to just say, you know, this is, I can see after you're hearing your presentation, this is a lot of complex things that had to be reviewed here. And I just want to thank you for distilling that all into a presentation that, that, that we can really see the clear takeaways and, and, um, you know, your findings. So, so thank you. Cause it was very scientifically really a deep dive into this. It's never been done before. So, um, and, and I want to say that it, it, uh, you know, for me, you know, while there's still some questions, you know, more work that needs to be done, it really does help us bookend, you know, what is kind of potentially uh, available. And the other takeaway, you know, for, for me, and, you know, we're seeing is, you know, for years, landscape irrigation projects were were always the buzz, and they're still important, you know, for for agencies uh, where they have sites that are cost effective nearby. But I think, you know, as I, I I'm seeing from your work, is if we really want to grow recycled water use on a 24/7 basis, um, that you know, with large demands, we're, we're we're needing to shift towards looking at some type of potable reuse, indirect or direct reuse. Uh, project. So, um, and I don't see any questions at the moment in the chat. And I want to, for the sake of time, I want to jump into Dave's presentation. So again, if you do have questions, put them in the chat. We're going to have a, a, a try to get a little Q and A here and here at the end. Um, and, and again, thank you so much, Harold, for for taking the time to join us from Davis today. I think you're up in Davis. <laughs> um, and it just, oh, just really quickly, and I don't know if this is a question you can answer, but if people want copies of the study, the WORF study, would that, they need to contact the Water Research Federation if they don't already have it? How would they, how would they get that? Uh, they could just email me and I'll send out a copy. Oh, great. Okay. I'll send you a copy and then you can send it to anyone who wants it. Perfect. Perfect. Fantastic. Okay. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's jump into the, now take a look at the, the local Bay Area perspective. Um, uh, with with the, our our next featured speaker, Dave Richardson. Uh, Dave, are you there? Are you ready? I'm ready. Um, okay, let me let me just give you a quick intro, uh, Dave. Uh, uh, many of you know Dave. He's he's also part of the planning committee task force. A longtime contributor to to our water reuse industry in the Bay Area in California. Um, and uh, Dave's a, a senior, I want to just quick intro here, Dave, I know you're a senior principal and an environmental and water resources engineer with Woodard and Kern, formerly with RMC, which was founded, of course, on the basis of advancing water recycling. That's where you got your start. Um, he manages uh, wastewater treatment and water recycling programs and projects, including the SAC Regionals um, uh, Sands Harvest Water Program. That's their big ag reuse project that I think many of you have heard about, which is a, a really interesting in lieu um, groundwater recharge project that Dave's been been overseeing. Um, he's also was has been the principal in charge for the Bakwa study that he's going to be talking about, which is looking at how we could use recycled water to to support nutrient reductions and in, in, in discharges to the bay, along with green infrastructure offsets. And, you know, like I said, Dave's just, I think he's touched just about every single way, way, recycle water master plan that I know of in the Bay Area and uh, over the, his three decades of contributions to, to our business. And, of course, I, I won't hold it against him. He's a, a Stanford grad on three degrees. He's got his BS and MS in civil engineering and even went to get his MBA. Um, and just really quickly, I, Dave, I want to acknowledge Kerry Del Boccio, Boccio with Woodard and Curran and of course Mike Falk with HDR because I know they put a lot into this. They were co-authors in, in your work. So Dave, take it away. Well, thank you, Don. I, I was hoping the introduction for me would be very short so that I could focus on, uh, on the presentation. I would like to go through uh, this presentation fairly quickly because I really want to um, get some input, uh, feedback, and 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 Q and A at the end. So uh, I will I will march through quickly, but uh, do you know do please um, ask ask questions at the end, put them in the chat, or or just raise your hand when we're done. 
All right. So first, I wanted to um, just uh, thank Bakwa uh, for funding this study and acknowledge Mary Cousins from Bakwa is is with us um, today, and 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 Lorraine Fono was able to join us for er early in the the session as well. Um, HDR Mike Falk was the principal project manager, working um, hand and side by side with Carrie Dobaccio of uh, of our team over here at Woodard and Curran, and also acknowledge Maggie Anderson, who was our project engineer at Woodard and Curran. She is joining us today and uh, just um, took over for Shelley when Shelley moved to uh, Hawaii, and, um, and uh, Shelley did a, a a great job with us as well in the study. Um, so next slide, Meg. Um, we will um, go over, um, this is an interesting, um, very specific look at recycling. Um, Harold's, I love, Harold, I love your your, your presentation, um, really informative. The paper is, the, the research paper is excellent. Um, I did, it did take me two steps to get because I went right to it and then I had needed a password. So I asked Carrie to send it to me. Um, so, uh, so Don, Don being the, the, the holder of the, of the research study will be really helpful. But this, this focus is really on how, how does um, a regulatory dr driver like nutrients um, interface with recycled water? And um, many of, of our findings are, are similar to Harold's, um, and yet they've got that unique piece of what um, about non-potable reuse being the opportunity to actually divert nutrients away from discharge. And uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll get into um, some details there. Uh, one of the real one of the drivers here, and really the the uh, main impetus for this study was the final second watershed permit findings, which we um, put together, uh, uh, which which uh, Bakwa has been coordinating for for the dischargers to the bay in in region two. Um, but um, I'll focus on the recycled water element. There's also um, the nature based solutions that we look that that the team looked at as well as just the ongoing work of, you know, how do we um, deal with nutrient reduction uh, Bay Area wide. Uh, I'll talk about the recycled water flow projections. Um, I'll give you the, the Bay Area perspective um, and put it in context of what Harold talked about for the Bay Area um, as a potential and then statewide, and then show you the nutrients that can be diverted by these projects and uh, a, a glimpse at the costs. Uh, I will, briefly mention the drivers and barriers that that our our team identified as we talked to each of the treatment plant representatives each all the 40 uh plants around the bay um just a summary of the what lessons we learned uh, in this in the bay area for for this study and then i'll do a quick contrast between uh harold's work and 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 our very focused uh work here uh, for bakwa in the bay area uh, next steps for for Bakwa with regard to recycling, and then uh, and then just remind, of course, for the wastewater folks that, that you won't need to to be reminded about the next steps. But it's really important for the for the region to just get a glimpse of of where we are in the, in the process of uh, addressing nutrients in the Bay Area um, as a as a really uh, important regulatory issue, but also very um, very much of a cost uh, capital cost and operating cost for the future. All right, next slide. Um, so the second watershed uh, permit, uh, many of you he have heard about this, but probably not in detail. I wanna just um, really focus in this presentation on the uh, the fifth box there, the regional study, which where, where, where the team looked at nature-based solutions, which would be like horizontal levees, wetlands, um, and those kinds of, of applications, as well as uh, recycled water. But um, the second watershed, uh, th th this permit is very innovative. Number one, it deals with um, with loads as or with um, nutrients as kilograms per day, um, a load based rather than concentration based. And what that does is it allows for analysis where diversion of water can actually help you with uh, complying with the permit. And it also looks at the seasonal impacts. Uh, rather than trying to get a load reduction across 12 months of the year, wet season when when the nutrients don't have as much impact, um, it's it's uh, focused on the on the dry weather period. So um, that that's very innovative. Um, there are no load caps yet, but they're, they're, uh, those are the um, subject of the next watershed permit. Um, the Bay Area has put a lot of the money that that um, uh, 
would be would be could could have been spent on um, studies by treatment plant into support for science, the science of of what what's happening in the bay and and why. And many of the many of the dollars that went into that work have really paid off during the algal bloom when we were able to work with SFEI and 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 pinpoint some of the issues that really. Um, you know, caused that or or stimulated that uh, algal bloom that we had last summer, and then then a smaller one this summer. We also recognized um, early actors, so uh, there, San Mateo, um, Oraloma, many of the Bay Area dischargers said, "Hey, we're ready to go. We're gonna we're gonna we're, we're gonna start our improvements now rather than waiting." But we also want to be recognized for for that and make sure that we don't overshoot or undershoot the target. So that that was that was a uh, important part of of the permit, and then group reporting has been um, really helpful, and you'll see the results of that in the presentation today, including group reporting on recycled water. Next slide. Um, so uh, I'll just uh, move past this one just to say that uh, we um, we did we did prepare a report. It's really long. It's got a lot of information, um, but uh, but individual uh, plant reports and and uh, the material is all is all available. I think I believe Mary may have put Mary Cousins may have put a, a link into the chat if you want to get access to specific information. Next slide. Um, okay, so uh, let's let's uh, talk about the recycled water um, findings in the second watershed permit. Next slide. All right, so this one, um, this one, I have to give uh, credit to Mike, and Mike is um, disobeyed the uh, the the cardinal rule of PowerPoint presentations and put more than six facts on the on the slide. But um, I'm going to progressively disclose it here so that it doesn't uh, come all at you at once. But it's trying to show um, what the recycled water flow projections are and how that relates to nutrient reduction. So next slide. On the left axis is the dry season recycled water um, diversion in acre feet per year. So you'll notice, you know, Harold was talking 2 million acre feet per year, 500,000 acre feet per year. We're on the scale of um, zero to 100,000 acre feet per year. And on the right side, um, it, it, tying with the black line is the um, average um, nitrogen load, total inorganic nitrogen load diverted associated with these recycled water projects. And so what's exciting is that it's a, a large amount, a significant number by the, by 2045 of nitrogen load. That's 7, 000, up to 7,000 kilograms of nitrogen per day that can be diverted. Um, and that's associated with or compared to the 50,000 or so kilograms per day that we're looking at in terms of the, the range of uh, potential future um, load requirements. So, you know, 6,000 plus um kilograms of nitrogen uh, would would if that were implemented would actually have a substantial impact on the bay area's ability to meet future nitrogen requirements but it's it takes time and what what you you see on the graph is just the confidence level one those are the projects that are really already in design or construction level two there are projects that are in master plans but um, not necessarily uh, started or funded yet um, level three is really conceptual um, that's the the rusty colored bar, and then a uh, level four is really blue sky. That's and 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 that one. Um, there's just a couple projects that we were able to get some of the agencies to say, yeah, we can't, you know, we can't say it's in the plan yet, but it's we're thinking about it. So, and that gets us that gets us to that final 2045 uh, load and volume. Now, this is, doesn't come without a, without a cost, and so the next slide will show the kind of cost impacts. Of this, and we found certainly the unit costs for these projects um, to be in the range of what Harold uh, presented and and higher. You know, it, it really um, we're really looking at at um, over two thousand dollars an acre foot uh, for most of the projects that the Bay Area agencies are are uh, looking at and committing to, and certainly the DPR IPR projects are going to be two thousand plus an acre foot, and the and the DPRs are going to be above that three thousand dollars an acre foot. So, um, so it, it it really it is um, a not a non trivial um, kind of investment. Next slide, and that's that's that shows you the the level of of capital and uh, O and M as expressed in net present value. So billions of dollars if we were to implement um, all of these projects. Next slide. 
just to show you that all the plants, uh, almost all the plants are represented um, in the Bay Area, 40 of the 40, we have projects, almost every single agency um, at least envisions doing one um, type of project over the next uh, 25 years. Um, next slide. Um, and in this, this slide shows, um, don't worry about the detail, but far right is year 2045. And again, um, there's only a few plants that that don't have projects listed, um, but all, almost all the plants have uh, a project in their in their their plan, either uh, master planned or conceptual. Next slide. So, um, and I really want to um, to wrap up here uh, before we we run out of time. So I'll just say that. That as far as distribution of the applications, um, the 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 black uh, parts of the circles are the are the the landscape irrigation. So landscape, as as Harold said in his study, statewide in terms of magnitude, landscapes not that big of a deal, and it's very complicated, very local. But for our study, it it is it's still a it's still a significant amount of the reuse um, actual and the reuse potential because and and the benefit because all, all those landscape irrigation projects divert nutrients from the bay of course there's the industrial component um, the power plants and refineries that uh, are served by recycled water today um, significant ones in in delta diablo service area east bay mud service area so th those those are those are a big deal and then we see the potential for potable reuse uh, for the future next slide so why are projects not happening? According to our um, Bay Area folks, um, it's it's a uh, um, you know water supply is 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 the biggest driver. Um, discharge regulations and and you know now with nutrients, um, there there can be uh, uh, more of that kind of driver. But the but the barriers are um, primarily funding, uh, jurisdictional. You know who's who's in charge of the recycled water, who gets the benefits. Um, institutional, we've got regulations that we have to to, to grapple with in terms of um, just indoor plumbing and and other other future requirements. One thing I wanted to add um, here with regard to bar barriers is Harold talked about conservation and the flow reductions um, that they they uncovered, and um, I agree with him that conservation of water has had a huge impact on recycling in terms of availability of of wastewater. The other thing that Harold didn't mention is that conservation, um, both passive conservation through code changes and, and then the pricing impacts of, of conservation, in other words, people using less water because water got more expensive, those had a huge impact on recycled water because pro recycled water projects would have happened, but conservation just came along because of, of uh, the changing code and, and plumbing code. And I and I've see, seen this in the Bay Area, but even in Sacramento, at the, the Harvest Water Project, uh, we've seen flows at the regional sand plant um, drop uh, from, you know, 120, 130 MGD to 100 MGD in the dry season um, while the population was was growing. So it's not just a, a Bay Area phenomenon or a Southern California, uh, Southern California phenomenon. Um, it's really it's really there. The other thing is that um, I think that the year round demand is happening more as we do these um, on site potable reuse project or on site non potable reuse projects um, that Don referred to earlier uh, for toilet flushing. Um, office building toilet flushing could be a uh, significant user of water uh, year round and and spread those costs out. All right. Well, to leave some time for Q and A, um, I'm going to move to the the final slides and just say that the lessons we've learned um, for the, from the Bay Area study are, don't forget about purple pipe. Um, it's really important, stay the course, um, but do, when you, when you put your purple pipe systems in, make sure you think about stranded assets so that eventually if you go to IPR, DPR, you, you have a use for the, for the purple pipe network. Um, recycled water is part of the answer to, to nitrogen load reduction in the Bay. And we also really need the water demand perspective Nutrient reduction alone will not drive the recycling. It's just too expensive on a dollars per kilogram basis to um, to justify. You need the water supply benefit and the nutrient reduction benefit to make it worthwhile. Um, next slide, uh, we really have already talked about. So I'll, I'll just flash by and say, um, Harold was talking about 500,000 plus acre feet of potential. Um, 
from just talking to all the Bay Area dischargers, we're more in the 140,000 acre feet per year for 2045. Of course, that number could grow uh, depending upon what, what forces um, and barriers we are able to remove. And the nutrient reduction potential is significant um, if we implement these recycled water projects in the Bay, um, up to over 10% of the, of the total loading that we're looking at Bay Area wide. And then finally, to wrap up, um, next steps, I just wanted to uh, acknowledge that BACWA has, is really taking a leadership position in, in promoting the conversation about recycling. Uh, they put on a seminar in September with SFEI, um, I think SFEI helped fund and brought some facilitation to, to bear. Melody, uh, I would just like to recognize Melody Labella was really the organizer spearhead behind that with support from Eric Rosenblum and Dave Smith and um, uh, a couple of other other folks whose names I'm uh, forgetting this very moment but um uh we'll uh we, we can we can talk about that in the in the, in the Q and a uh, it was a great uh, seminar that they put together brought water and wastewater agencies together to talk about recycled uh recycling potential and then finally, just um, building reuse into BACWA's advocacy for both uh, funding, regulatory reform, and other initiatives. So it's great to see BACWA just taking such a um, strong role in, in, in this area. And then finally, um, I just wanted to acknowledge um, the, our partners on, on this study, um, that regional nutrients uh, is a hot topic. We're moving forward um, into the third watershed permit, which is slated for 2024. Um, recognize Mike Falk uh, as a contact if you have any questions about the regional nutrients, uh, either Mike or Lorian Fono from Bakwa or Mary Cousins from 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 Bakwa. Um, they are the they are the experts on uh, on regional nutrients. And um, so, thank you all. Um, final slide. Uh, oh, and and Lorian just um, corrected me. It was SFEP. Uh, which is a San Francisco Estuary Partnership, not SFEI. So I thank you, Lorian, for uh, recognizing that. SFEI is on this slide um, really doing a lot of the scientific work uh, around nutrients, but SF SFEP helped uh, promote that recycled water workshop. So next slide, and I'll, Don, I'm wrapped up. I uh, I wish I'd left a little more time for, for, for discussion, but uh, Really wanted to thank uh, BACWA, all of the BACWA members. Uh, many of you are on the call today and, and appreciate uh, you being here. HDR, our partner, and, uh, the, and the BACWA staff. Great, Dave. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful overview of what we're doing here in the Bay Area. Appreciate you, you getting through that real quickly there. And we still have some time left for, for Q&A. Got a few minutes. So I want to just open it up. Uh, to, to the audience, any any questions for, for our presenters before we close? I'm not, not hearing anything. Um, it, I, I, I have a question for, for Dave. <laughs> what, what, what do you, what you, is your thinking um, that, uh, that, 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 what you're thinking about potable reuse in terms of, of, of the Bay Area, you know, in terms of advancing recycling? Oh, Don, Don, thank you for asking. <laughs> now I can get, get, get on my soapbox. Um, two things. Number one, potable reuse is going to absolutely be improved and enhanced thanks to uh, BACWA and the nutrient reduction effort. Once nutrients are reduced at many of the larger treatment plants, it's going to open up and make make potable reuse more cost effective because you, you've got to get, got to deal with the nitrogen. Otherwise, if you don't, then all the nitrogen ends up in the in the brine uh, from the RO uh, in the RO concentrate and and is would be a nightmare to permit. So that's number one. Um, but don't forget about non potable because non potable reuse right now is um, can be cost effective. Um, water rates are are high and increasing, especially in uh, on the peninsula um, and in the city. Uh, so um, don't forget about non-potable, but but potable will be will be part of the future. And then finally, if we can if we can just look at technologies other than RO, so that we don't end up with um, with the brine, um, I think we've got to as an industry we really have to look at that to make potable reuse viable long term and 
Reno's doing doing the studies now. Uh, Upper Occoquan in Virginia has been been actually implementing potable reuse for for um, decades um, effectively without RO. So, um, but our regulatory framework right now is is all based upon RO. So we 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 have to we have to tackle that that uh, that challenge to make it work. And it's just interesting to see, you know, agencies that were traditionally really focused on the non-potable landscape type projects now are reformulating their 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 long range planning to really incorporate potable reuse because, you know, it, it's such a large volume every day of the year and, and, and uh, you know, not just a seasonal demand. So even though it is it is substantially more expensive and you have to deal with the brine issue. If you right. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank, thank you for that question, Don. <laughs> Appreciate it. Okay. And any, anyone else out there? I, I know Bob Whitley and, 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 and Gary often have uh, pointed thoughtful questions. Would you like to chime in? Either of you? Are you on? Bob always chimes in. <laughs> yes. I want to give him the opportunity. You're on mute, Bob. I'm sure what he's saying is quite good. Yes. <laughs> that darn mute mute button. Um, no, no I, I think that you guys covered it very well, uh, Harold. A lot of new information, and and uh, Dave, uh, you know what the Bay Area is doing is is fascinating. And so keep keep up the good work. Now Bob's off off of uh, mute. Do you have anything, Bob? No, I was just going to thank both presenters. That was uh, yeah. a lot a lot of information in in this hour plus. So so. A lot to comprehend. So thank you. All right. Well, I think we're that's a wrap. And thank you for attending today. We had over 30 people. That's fantastic. Uh, and a, a, a very good topic and good presenters. So thank you very much. And look forward to seeing you probably in person. We'll, we'll uh, figure that out uh, for November. So